Hi, and welcome to Discovery, Knight Foundation's weekly series that looks at the creation of informed and engaged communities throughout, through the lens of artists and the arts. I'm Victoria Rogers, Vice President of Arts. Today we'll be discussing the dance community, how it's coping, reimagining itself, and embracing change. Joining me in a minute will be Christy Bolingbrook, Executive and Artistic Director of the National Choreography Center in Akron, and Lourdes Lopez, Artistic Director of the Miami City Ballet, for a conversation about moving from reaction to action through COVID and beyond. For our viewers, please submit your questions throughout the show via Zoom using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, through Twitter using the hashtag Night Live, and in the comments section of the Facebook live stream. Christy and Lourdes, welcome to Discovery. Hi, Victoria. Hi. Hi. It's good to see your faces. Yes, yeah, thank you so much for guys. having us. You're welcome. So you, get, you two are paired because while you're both deeply ingrained in the arts, you bring really different experiences and a different point of view to the table. So for our audience in our prep meeting, we, the, two, the three of us covered a lot of ground. We looked at relevant, survival, reimagining dance, what do you keep, what do you jettison, wellness, service, resiliency, performance limitations and opportunities. So three hours later, <laughs> we're gonna cut this down to 30 minutes. But Lourdes, let, let's start with something that you had said that I, I was really interested in. You talked about dance isn't fragile, and then you went to the more specific the model, the more vulnerable it is. And being a Balanchine company and a former Balanchine prima ballerina, I think you have some experience with that. So if you don't mind, kick us off and let, let's start down this track of what is, how are we gonna reimagine dance? Um, thank you, Victor. I'd love to. And, and listen, thank you for this opportunity to also um, to discuss these things because I think that we're, when we're, you know, we're so in, in a Zoom and in our own world and the ability to speak to you and to Christy and to others in the field um, and even outside our field is incredibly important because this is a time truly where um, everything is on the table. I mean, everything is on the table. It's a paradigm shift. It's, it's really a, a complete change. But my, um, Really, my statement was that dance is not fragile. The arts are not fragile. They've been around, um, you know, since the beginning of time. As long as human beings will be on this earth, they'll exist because art is created by human beings. And so I feel, and I always have felt, that the more you protect something, the more vulnerable you become, right? Um, the whole point of an art form is that it has to evolve the way human, it, it's an expression of life. So as life and human beings evolve, so does the art form. Um, any art form, and, 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 so, and so should artists, so you do have to give them that, that freedom. And, you know, I, yes, I am a, a product of the, the Balanchine aesthetic and the Balanchine um, uh, style and, and view, but you have to remember, he was really one of the greatest creative geniuses of the 20th century. He changed his art form, and so it was never a precious thing that you held on, on to. In fact, if you believe it's powerful as, as we do, um, and Christy, I know that you shared this with me, but if you believe the art form is powerful, if you believe it's transformative, if you believe it's, it should be part of your everyday life, which all of us on this panel believe that, then you have to somehow let it go and allow it to do just that in every single environment. Because um, I really believe that what we do continues to matter. And what the interesting thing about now uh, and the extraordinary, uh, I think, um, wonderful challenge is to find different ways of doing it. Um, so I don't yeah. know if that answers your question. <laughs> I think it does. I, love to go ahead, Christy, there. go ahead. Yeah, um, we knew that that would be a part of it in this improvisation. <laughs> um, it, it is exactly that invitation when you talk, when you were talking, Lourdes, about um, not holding on so tightly, because I find that that also, if we think about what it is to move, you, you lose the opportunities. You, you're too rigid to be able to move through something else. And, and I think in this moment, our uh, standard assumptions about time and place and space are all up for grabs. And so if those are no longer restrictions for us as dance makers, then 
what, what do you discover? What are the new opportunities? So talk some more about that, Christy. Well, I mean, with the opportunities, and that, this is what I really appreciated when Lourdes had introduced for us that, you know, if you're too specific in what you do, then you can't find any other room. And by too specific, we might offer like, we know that the, a lot of players in our ecology might do 40 or 50 weeks of programming. That meant when COVID first hit, they were in a constant state of trauma and cancellation and just reacting over and over again. They were too tightly you know, holding on and having to adapt to uh, managing where they were already so tightly made. Even pre-COVID, they had no space or room for experimentation. So this opportunity now to consider it has been something, you know, for us at NCC Akron, we normally uh, bring artists in through Akron. We get to host them. We get to share the, the rich environment of Akron. I like to say there's a lot of space, you know, mental space, emotional space, physical space. And we were like, we, that immediately got taken away from us. So it came a question of, well, we're not here just to make new dances. We're here to support artists. We don't just do residencies. We're about supporting the people involved. How could we still take care? How could we still inspire room to play? And so we're, we took a while to experiment with it, but that's one of the reasons we're offering residency in a box. Now, we've never, sold anything because we don't sell tickets. So that was a, a, an opportunity to experiment and fail. But we were really thinking, how could we share parts of Akron uh, elsewhere? How could we also inspire other people to operate from a place of abundance where they could say, hey, you know, I want to gift this to you, a care package. I hadn't gotten those since college. And I think all of us right now, the mail means so much importantly to us to get something actually from a person. Uh, and then we saw more opportunities with that idea of abundance to expand and realize like, oh, it's not about us making money in this moment, but how do we continue to pay it forward and sharing the proceeds of these residencies in a box with other organizations that are doing equity work in dance. So we're trying to still move as a network like we are but it's not something that would have been on our radar before COVID because we were so focused on the things that we're doing, the people that come to Akron. So that's really where it's been an opportunity to transcend time and place and space. Thanks for that. So Lourdes, you've been doing a lot of experimentation as well with how dance is presented and you've, you're sort of going down that digital way in some cases. Why don't you talk a little bit about that and what you're, what you're seeing in the future? Sure. I mean, absolutely. Look, and I will, I will admit it. I was one of those individuals that were, you know, early, late 19th century, early 20th century. I had to be in the studio and I, I had to have the human being and I had to be in the theater. I mean, I, you know, it was, um, it was the world that I grew up in. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and it pushed us all off that cliff. I mean, we're all off the cliff already. So, um, and I, as a really, as a, I'm incredibly proud of Miami City Ballet because we we moved with lightning speed. I mean, with lightning, lightning speed, and and um, and it really is the philosophy of, of this is a powerful art form and it can do anything you want it to do. So I approached the school and I just said, I know, I get it. It's on Zoom. I get it's a computer. I understand all of that but can we just not try to figure out how to continue, just what Christy's talking about, continue giving these classes to students because it was really the school that was at that point the most vulnerable. Yeah. And we did one week of pilot classes and to my surprise, to my surprise, I'll be the first to admit it, it worked. I mean, it, it wasn't, it was just different. Right, so that's what I've learned. It's not either or, it's not one or the other. It's, it's the ability to do this hybrid, um, thoughtful, um, uh, I, I do not experiment, really organization or offering. And so we, we, we had a week of pilot classes to these pre-professional students that within two weeks turned into 108 classes. And I realized that there are aspects of how we were doing business now that would really be interesting to keep as we move forward for both company and school. 
trying to do the digital world and the digital space? What, what did it allow us to do that we couldn't do because we were restricted by a proscenium theater? We were restricted by the four walls. We were restricted by bricks and mortar. And so that opened up a whole, it was really truly like a aha moment, like the, um, and I approached um, Duranta Versola, a young kind of, you know, with it, a choreographer that was uh, a product of uh, the um, Miami City Ballet School. And I knew it had to be someone who wasn't, um, how should I say, closed off or wasn't so ensconced in the old world of ours. Uh, and I said, listen, can you create a ballet, a work, remotely? Everyone is in a different place. You can't come together. You figure it out. And and he did. They did. It, it, it was just extraordinary. And it just shows to me that art will really find a way. I think what we've seen, if, um, if I may, if you just give me a few more minutes, I think what we've seen is that um, people can create digitally and people can create remotely. There are two issues, as I see, that I, that I, I would love to speak about. One is, I think it's the age old question. In other words, what's the message you deli you're, you're delivering? Um, because it's not about filming a dancer somewhere uh, or filming an actor somewhere. It's, it's really about, is it art? Are you still delivering? And I don't mean good or bad, I said, are you still delivering a message? Are you still, is it still relevant? Are you creating an emotion from your audience? And then the other thing is monetizing it. And I, Victoria, it is, I, I tell you, we were, um, I just feel that in terms of dance, we, they're eating our lunch, right? Meaning we were, we were so, we were like live, we're live, we're in the moment, you'll never see it again. It's, a, you know, human, and all of a sudden the sports are doing it. Every other, every other art form had to figure out how to do digital and we were somehow, um, caught unawares. And so that's for me, how do we, because we have to survive. That's our business model. We have to be able to make revenue. I mean, I hate to be so crass, crass about it. I mean, I'd love to respond. Sorry, Please do. Um, well, uh, the, you lay a lot down there, Lourdes, but one of the things that came up um, when you talked about the classes, um, I, I would want to uh, highlight some work that Dance Church, Kate Wallach and the YC have been doing out of Seattle. Now, before COVID, their form of classes already were a little less precious and a little less traditional. Um, they often had a live DJ. They often had the uh, dancer wearing a Madonna mic or a Britney mic, depending on your generation, uh, leading class. That already made them more nimble to pivot and do it online. Then we discover new things about capacity online. They average 900 to 1,000 people who tune in two to three times a week to take what's advertised as a dance party that you wish you had been at the night before. And that's so fascinating to me. I don't want to be in a studio with 900 people taking a dance class, right? That, that would be us from a more traditional standpoint. And so that's exciting about how it could find and tap new areas and how it was specific to Kate's particular artistic point of view. I'm not saying that it's a, a realistic goal for all other art forms, but thinking like literally outside the box of our studio to, to consider <laughs> what else could we do. The idea of um, are we making the art and, and the different opportunity, that, that's actually a concern that I have for the field because some companies are starting to work again and they're like, great, we just put on a mask and we're just gonna have you do the same dance that we made 10 years ago in a park. Okay, that's what I call dance flop, not site specific dance. So the opportunity with film is a creative one to say like, yeah, you couldn't normally bring in redwood trees into the concert venue. Um, how else do you want to respond into your environment and then make that a part of your art as opposed to making it something, you know, that you're just like, this is an alternative compromise. That's still the, the emotional reaction. We still need to dance as opposed to the proactivity of where else can I go with this art form. So Christy, with the different choreographers that you work with, 
what is, what is that message that they're trying to convey now? What are you seeing, you know, out in the field? Yeah, I mean, it, I think what's immediately felt is questioning, why do I even do this? Do I want to continue to do this moving forward? It can be paralyzing for some who um, realize how precarious their entire existence and way of making was to begin with. 80% of the dance field, is, as you've heard me say often, is working on a project basis. In some ways, that actually lent them more room to pivot. They didn't have to worry about maintaining, you know, a, a earned revenue stream and how when that bottom dropped out as far as seven weeks of performances or ticketing. But that also meant that they feel the squeeze more immediately because not only did their audiences or their gigs shore up, but maybe other things like they're used to be working in restaurants and, and you know, having Pilates clients. So there's like, I think a lot of an existentialism right now. And then we have the added pandemics and of the racial justice movement adding on to that and the politics of the dancing body. So it's a really rich opportunity. A lot of the artists um, either are pivoting and adapting work that they already had in the, in the works things that they had been making for the last two or three years. And now they're going, well, how can I share this now? We work with Camille Fisoko, who uh, adapted his chameleon project into a series of installations that the New York Times covered in April. And they're having another round later this weekend. Um, but we also are working with artists who maybe thought they were gonna start to go into the studio this fall. And now they're going, I'm really questioning, like, how do I decolonize my body in this moment? How do I be responsive to the racial justice movement? How do I be a part of the solution moving forward? And so maybe it's not about me producing something in the next three months, six months, or even year. And guess what? That could be a good thing because they might not have anywhere to perform it if need be. So if anything, it's elongated the, the deep gestation period. Um, but yeah, existential crisis, I think, is the, <laughs> the uh, summarizing message right now. So we got a, a question. Do, do you think these innovative performances, whether it's virtual or, or what else, will shape the performing arts after the pandemic? You know, I know we've had that conversation. If, you, if we go to some hybrid form, what does that look like mm -hmm. when you can return to a performing venue and people will actually come to, to see it? Mm -hmm. I, I would, I would, I actually bring back Lourdes's comment. It's not either or. Yeah. If anything, it's more democratizing because I, I, I've often said, like in dance films, you could spend thirty or forty thousand dollars making a five-minute dance film, and it could then tour to twenty cities. And the reality in dance, if you're only holding on to the live performance, you could also spend thirty or forty thousand dollars and perform it for three nights in your hometown in front of 400 people, and that's the end of the piece. It never gets seen again. So my hope is that it's not about, oh, now I have to do live performance and I have to do virtual performances, but that this is the opportunity to experiment. And then when we can convene again, some artists may choose never to go back into the theater. They found another outlet, another way to deliver their message. And that, that's what excites me about how the performing arts field is, that live performance isn't always a uh, assumed end. And you know, like that's the only way we do it, but that we were mm -hmm. finding other ways. You know, I, th I think that relates, Lourdes, to a comment that you'd made before relating to how you found another aha moment that digital also enabled you to highlight what your dancers do you know, the personality of them, the uniqueness of the Miami City Ballet. You want to talk a little bit about that as you're looking at what you're doing going forward? Sure, and I, and I, think, um, I think Victoria actually relates beautifully to what uh, Christy yeah. um, was just talking about, um, because I, I do think that you have to, at least I feel, um, that I've got to look at, at the mission of Miami City Ballet and the, the reason for being of Miami City Ballet and and think of a different, um, uh, of a broader model to it, because it, we are not going to go back to what we were 
um, before. If we do, it'll be, it'll be some time, but it's not going to, I don't believe it's going to be in the near future. And I have to tell you, honestly, I'm not, I, I don't know that I want to go back to that, right? Yeah. There's, like I said, there's something, there's a lot of really exciting stuff that is happening now that I think is, can be part of a hybrid model, which I think is much more um, democratic, right? The ability to kind of go out there a little bit more, um, so I, I am questioning, as, as the artistic director, I am questioning, you know, the theaters that we dance in, um, the performances that we do, do we need that production? Does it have to be in that, those, those walls? So it, it opens up a whole brand new kind of world um, as it does. I'm, I, I'm kind of excited to see what these choreographers and what these artists are going to start to create, right, post-COVID. Um, but I think in respect to digital is, um, you know, I, I don't think, well, there are very few people that watch more ballet, and I, I, I talk about specifically ballet here, than I do. And um, at the very beginning, it was, you know, was, I was watching everything. And um, I came away thinking, you know, in, in real life, um, every single company around the United States looks different. And that's what's so exciting about it, right? You go to um, you'll go to Chicago, or you go to Boston, or Seattle, or San Francisco, or New York, Miami. Everyone has their DNA. They have the DNA of their city in them. And it's wonderful to see. And somehow on digital, it started looking the same. I mean, even European companies started, and I realized that it has to do with, it's a, it's a different medium. Right, so it, it, one thing is filming a work that is being performed for proscenium stage with a theater, with a production. It's, it's from one perspective, the audience's perspective, and that's it. And then the, that doesn't always distinguish individuality, right, mm -hmm. that you see in a live performance. Once you get to digital, you really have to I think it just opens up your world because you can then be the eye for the audience. You can just say, this is, this is what I believe the choreographer would want you to see. This is a really important part of it. You can zoom in, you can zoom out. There's a whole narrative that takes place that's not just what you see on the stage, but it has to come from a very different, I think, perspective. And I'm not a, I'm not a director or producer, but I think from a very different um, part of your creative mind um, to, to deliver it through film and through digital and um, because it's, it's just a different language. It's a different language. And that's when I think it's going to get exciting because right now uh, what I'm seeing, in, including with Miami City Ballet, except for, the, except for these digital commissions, is really an archival work that was performed at a certain yeah. day in a theater from this perspective. And so it becomes flat where art is not flat. It, it, no, it, it certainly is not. So we have a, a question here from Hadassah. Once we are able to move around more freely, do you think that audiences are going to continue to be so interested in virtual performances? Or will they prefer to return to the theater? Will you need to pivot again, at least in part? Hmm. Um, I, I... We'll jump on that one a little bit, Hadassah. As a recovering marketer um, from earlier in my career, I love the audience and opportunity. And um, I, I think one of the things pre-COVID, we were already dealing with a, a drop-off or limited audiences. And I often assign that to a generation that didn't have any sort of arts education in school. And uh, so we needed to be able to expand. And so if there's anything in this moment and, and really capitalizing on the digital opportunities is think about how many new people we're reaching. They might may not know the difference, uh, Lourdes, between regional companies and the, the individuality, but they may be actually paying attention or watching a video of Swan Lake for the first time. Um, and if anything, that's the opportunity that we have now is what is the, we talked a little bit in our prep session about like, what is the new cycle of engaging these audiences? How do we continue to expand with people? And also recognize that if there are people who are engaging with us online, they may never go into the concert hall because they weren't gonna go into the concert hall anyways. How has this removed some of the barriers about that? So I do think that there will be audiences that want to return. 
um, but they likely were the same people who were coming to our shows beforehand. And one of the questions that we may have to consider here in the field is how are we bringing along people who've only ever engaged with us digitally? And are we gonna continue to only meet them where they're comfortable or are we going to try and build an, an on-ramp into the theaters again? What might that on-ramp look like? Lorda, you, you looked like you had a thought going there. No, I just kind of wanted to jump in because I just thought what Chrissy said was, um, was so interesting, um, if I may. So we had at Miami City Valley a very different experience. So we had, um, we didn't finish our program four, so we just got, uh, you know, three quarters of the way through, and we had already exceeded our ticket sales historically. So we've never had, we, this was the highest selling season. So we were just truly, truly building um, what I'd say this, this, um, this base, this, this really fan base, it's really was a fan base um, when everything kind of dropped dead. And it was, I have to tell you, it was, it was a moment of, of, of kind of panic, right? Because I thought, but I believe that once we are done with this virus and it's a, there's a vaccine and because this is not going to be the rest of our lives, it'll be a, a part of it, but it's not going to go on for the rest of our lives, that there'll be, that there's this wonderful opportunity. And that's why I said that we were somehow, the dance world, I think, was left um, in the dark ages. Um, there's this wonderful opportunity to do a hybrid, very similar to sports. So the sports... Um, analogy, they figured it out. They, you know, you're, you're there in that, in watching those tennis players, you're in that, that stadium, you're, woo -woo, you're, everyone's next to you, you're just so excited. And you have an individual who's at home, you know, sitting in front of their television, they're just as excited. It's how you deliver what you're seeing, right? And so I do think that there's, um, there's just this wonderful opportunity um, not only to, to reach a, a broader audience and a larger audience that we wouldn't. I mean, there are dancers now that are taking class with teachers in Europe. You just have to wake up at the time, right? It's, it's extraordinary to me. So what was, what was limited before, all those barriers are out. You have other barriers, but those barriers are out. So I think there's this just great opportunity for truly, truly a very different model a very different model, not going back to what we did before, but incorporating aspects. Um, and there'll be, you know, it's, it's we, the dance world has not seen a change like this in I don't know how long. It's been years. We're the oldest art form out there. We, we've held on, to, at least <laughs> ballet, we've held on to this and it's kind of free. Christy, you want to have one final co comment before we cut this off? Well, sure. I just want to also offer, I, early on, I had to remind myself, it, it took 70, 80 years to build the uh, ecology market the way the dance is operating. And it's going to take a while for it to adjust, but this is the most dramatic, I agree, Lourdes, the most dramatic shift and invitation for us to make some of those adaptations that it might have taken us much longer to scale or adapt. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I think that we're up for the challenge. If there's anything dance knows, it's how to pivot and we're ready for it and a ball change and a move through space. And that's why I so appreciated the, the opportunity for us to talk about this is not a moment uh, that even though it, we're not moving together, that we're necessarily standing still. Not a moment to waste, for sure. And at some point in time, we need to have another, I, I would really like to have the time to talk about the decolonization. I think that it, it's such an important issue today and the, and the bodies that are being presented, who, you know, who has agency in this. So that's, enough, that's for another go round. But unfortunately, our time is up. We try to keep these to uh, 30 minutes. Really want to thank all of you for joining us. Special thanks to Chrissy Bolingbrook and Lourdes Lopez and to the night production crew. The beats at the top of the show were created by Chris Barr, the director of art and technology here at night. And the music that will play us out is composed and performed by jazz pianist Theron Brown, also from Akron. Next week for Discovery, I'll be joined by Dina Hagag, president and CEO of US Artists. I hope you'll join us 1 p.m. Eastern have a great weekend, guys. Thanks so much to the two of you. Thank you. Bye.